Okay, so today we're going to be talking about transactions. Transactions are a major feature of all good database servers. Um, some do it better than others. Uh, specifically, MySQL is pretty terrible at its um, transaction management. It's got some very interesting limitations. Um, and so I'm going to talk about transactions. Um, I'm going to talk about some recovery and concurrency issues. So a transaction is a single or multiple actions carried out by a database or an application or a person, because basically a person triggers an event and an application will do things. And it carries and it updates and reads and changes and deletes records in a database. So when you add a, you do a single insert, that's a transaction. You update 25 records, that it could be a single transaction depending on what you're trying to do. Um, by default, MySQL and Postgres treat every single insert, update and delete as a single transaction. So every time you type in an insert statement, it runs it as a single unit of work. Oracle is the other way around where it won't make any changes unless you tell it to make the changes explicitly. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server tends to be um, immediate transaction also, unless you turn them on. Okay, so transactions are a unit of recovery, consistency, and integrity. So that means that when you run a transaction in a database, you can choose to group certain actions as a single logical unit of work. So whenever you think about a transaction database, it's literally a logical unit of work. So in other words, a single insert could be a logical unit of work because it only needs to do one insert. If you need to move money around, so you're thinking about bank accounts, so you need to take money from account A and put it in account B. Really, that is two or three steps. And that's a single unit of work. So a bank will start a transaction, then it'll take... I want to transfer $50 from A to B. So depending on the bank, they do it, they all do it a little bit differently, but they all do, essentially do the same thing. So bank account A is there, bank account B is there. Bank account B gets $50 added, and then it removes $50 from account A. You can't take 50 away from A and add 50 to B as a single step because that's just not how it works. So either you take 50 away from A, then you put 50 in B, or you put 50 in B, then you take 50 away from A. So it's two steps for a single transfer. And often there's actually another step, making sure that the, the, the values are correct after it's done the work. Um, that is a logical unit of work. So there are four specific properties when you want to talk about transactions. There's It's called ACID. That's the acronym. It's an, finally an easy acronym to remember. Um, it stands for atomicity, and I almost never pronounce this word right. It just does not want to come out of my mouth. So atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. I'll be going through what each of those things mean in a minute. And I already explained what a logical unit of work was. Essentially, a transaction does something in the database, and for it to be a valid transaction, no part of it alone achieves anything of use or interest. In other words, um, any given part of a unit of work, every single piece must do something to belong to that. Now, it might do something in multiple places, and that's still a valid transaction, but it still needs to do something of use or interest. Otherwise, if it's not actually doing anything, then it's not shouldn't be part of a transaction. Yes. And here we go. So, atomicity. Transactions are atomic. They do not have separate parts conceptually. Even if you are doing five inserts, two updates, and three deletes, if all those things need to happen for the transaction to be successful, that is considered a single unit of work. Therefore, it's atomic unto itself. You can think a bit about um, getting yourself out of bed in the morning. There's a lot of steps involved in getting your ass out of bed in the morning. You might not realize just how much. 
I often, when I was, when I used to teach programming classes, I used to use getting out of bed as the example of steps that you don't even realize you need to take. And it's easy. You just go, okay, alarm just went off. Your lay, your initial state is you're on your back with your eyes closed. Our alarm is now ringing. What are the steps to get out of bed? Technically, every single step you do, including from turning off the alarm to opening your eyes to rolling over, uncovering yourself, sitting up, including, you know, pushing yourself up, whichever way you do it, then, you know, standing out of your bed, that's considered a single transaction because you're getting yourself out of bed. That's the unit of work, but each of those steps are part of that process. Any of those steps fail, and you're going to fail getting out of bed. Right? You turned off the alarm, then you didn't open your eyes. Congratulations, you're going back to sleep. Transaction failed. You know, oh, you got your eyes open, you turned over, and then you didn't uncover. Guess what? You're going back to sleep. Transaction failed, right? So even if a transaction has multiple steps to it, if every step in it must be completed, that is considered an atomic transaction. It cannot be executed partially, which is the example I just used about getting out of bed. To get out of bed, you have to successfully do every piece. Otherwise, you're not going to get out of bed. You might end up in an inconsistent state. In other words, you try to get up out of the bed, and then you fail doing that, and you land face down on the ground. Not going to describe how that may or may not have happened after a really wild weekend in college. But, you know, the, the difference things can happen and cause your transactions to fail. So for it to be an for the atomicity, for it to be atomic, let's go with that, um, every step of the transaction must complete and it cannot, if anything in there fails, that means the entire thing fails. So it's an atomic, self-contained, cannot be divided further. Consistency. Transactions will take the database from one consistent state into another. The middle of the transaction, the database may not be consistent. And again, that's perfect. The example, the bank, the bank example is the best example of that. So if we go, if we do a transaction that looks like this, so we've got, I'm going to go back to my account A and my account B. All right, so we've got account A and account B. Account A has $500 in it. Account B is your savings account, so it's got $1,000. Excuse me. Now we want to transfer $50 from A to B. So before the transaction start, the database is consistent. Excuse me. In other words, there's nothing happening to A, nothing happening to B, things are static. So now we're going to start the transaction and we're going to do it the CIBC way, which in their case is they credit the destination before they decrement the source. <coughs> Excuse me. So what they'll do is they will, our transaction starts here. They'll add $50 to B. So now we are suddenly at $1,050. And then they will decrement this. So suddenly we have $450 in this account. Okay. So in the end, our ending numbers look like this. However, there was two steps. At this point, technically, the two accounts had 500 and 1,050. This is inconsistent because really what we're doing is we're taking $50 away from one, putting it in the other. Then we take out this 50 and then we complete the transaction. So now the database is consistent because everything that was supposed to happen has happened. If for some unknown reason, the database server fails here, our database will be inconsistent. In other words, this account will have more money than it's supposed to. This is what it means when, if it's in the middle of a transaction, the database may be inconsistent while that's happening. The goal is, is that when you start the database is consistent, when it finishes, the database is in a consistent state. Stuff happening in the middle may not be so consistent. 
And if we did it the Royal Bank way, Royal Bank's extra special. I actually know somebody, actually I know two people that worked in the bank in the banks and they explained how their COBOL code, because it's written in COBOL, how theirs works. Transaction starts here. They actually have a hidden account on everybody's account. So it'll go, transaction starts here. It will go minus $50 plus 50, which will bring us to 550. I mean, uh, 450. Then it'll add $50 to this, minus 50. So then suddenly we have 1050 here, 450 after it's all done. Uh, apparently something about how their old their database was originally written did not allow you to just go from one to the other. Which one's the safest? I really don't know. Like this table here actually keeps tracks what account the money came from and where the money went. It's almost like a log. Um, you know, so at least if it fails partway through, they can look at here and see what the state was supposed to be. It's kind of cool. Um, and in the end, C also ends up being consistent because it started at $0 and it ended at $0. So at least the RBC way is this hidden account should always be $0 except when things are happening. I think it's because the original system that they had didn't support proper transactions. So they created their own transaction mechanism. Well, I mean, yeah. COBOL doesn't actually have transactions. So that's very likely why it is the way it is. Okay, so that's consistency. So the goal is, is that you always want to end up being, the database is consistent before you start. The database is consistent when you're done. What happens in the middle is just free for all. Isolation. And actually, I'll be demonstrating all this as a quick demo at the end of the class, which will show you how to do like 80% of the lab. So, so isolation, the effects of a transaction are not visible to other transactions. So the concept is that while this transaction is happening, suddenly, um, While this was happening, your hydro bill decides to come out at the same time while this is happening. As far as the hydro bill is concerned, the account has $500 right up till this moment. So it is entirely possible that it'll try to take out the 160 while this is happening. It'll use a, an algorithm to figure out the order of up. So if this started first, it'll finish it and then do apply this one. But in theory, these happen invisibly to each other. So this transaction is invisible to this transaction and vice versa. So while the transaction is processing, everything on the outside doesn't see it. It's like it doesn't happen. It's happening in memory. And essentially, because it's self-contained and nobody on the outside can see it, it's basically a consequence of it being atomic, right? Because every step must be completed. Therefore, if it's atomic, nobody on the outside can see it happen until it's finished. Database servers are really uh, exceptionally clever at transactions. Uh, durability, that one's a really easy concept. Once the transaction finished, it gets applied to the database and it's saved. Once it's committed, it can't be rolled back. So that's what durability means. It means when it starts out, it's consistent. Once it's completed, it gets written. It's consistent. It gets written out to the disk. Then it's done. And that's me. That's not embarrassing. Nope. That was me forgetting to mute my phone. That's all. So. So essentially it's saying if the server crashes, the changes must stick. So in other words, if it reaches this state and it's written out to the disk, when you recover the database server, these changes are still supposed to be there. That's what durability stands for. The stuff that's ephemeral 
has various states of whether or not it's going to get applied. And I'm actually going to talk about that towards the end of the slides. And, well, all right, there's the bank account example that I just finished doing. Um, so I, I'm not going to go through the slide because I just finished doing it on the board. Okay, there, every database server that supports transactions has something called a, a transaction manager. And it uses row locks, timestamps, um, and actually really cool, like database servers like Postgres, for example, will actually cause a temporary lock on the row. What it does, it takes the row, copies it into memory, works against it, and then copies it back so that the row doesn't change until the transaction is completed and everything else doesn't care. It's kind of cool. It also has a log, and if different database servers do this slightly differently, but there is a log that's being written to the disk. It's known as a write-ahead log. And good database servers, and MySQL finally got this recently. It has a proper, what they call a proper wall, write-ahead log. So that what happens is a transaction that's being written to the database gets written to the write-ahead log first. Then it runs it so that if something goes wrong, it can replay the write-ahead log to recover the situation. Um, the transaction manager enforces the asset properties. It schedules the operations, like what I was talking about here, where this one started first. Therefore, this one's going to have to wait for this to finish. But it will only have to wait for the changes that apply to this to finish. Any changes to any other accounts in the system will not be blocked. And there's two commands, one called commit, one called rollback. Basically, commit forces it to write to the disk. Rollback says undo. It's as close to undo in a database as you can get. So rollback signals unsuccessful end of a transaction. So something went wrong, and a rollback was issued. There's multiple things that can trigger a rollback. An error can trigger a rollback. A a DDL command will trigger either commit or rollback, depending on what's happening. Um, and when a rollback happens, it's as if none of this happened. So let's just say we have my we have my example that I've had on the board here, and we get to the point where we are here, and we're about to do this step, right? So, so we're at four fifty. We're about to debit the fifty dollars from here to put over here, and then something happens. Server crashes, power outage. What it'll do is the rollback literally brings us right back to that condition, that state. It's as if the transaction never happened. That's what a rollback does. A commit, on the other hand, writes it to the disk. It's done. You're committing. Literally, you're committing to the fact this is correct. And the second you commit, the changes are visible to anything else happening in the database server. All right, so recovery. Uh, so as always, prevention is better than a cure. So you want to make sure that your OS is reliable. Um, make sure the server is not having issues. Uh, make sure your security is up to date. Probably want to have a UPS and a surge protector uh, if you're not using something like Amazon. Uh, you're probably going to use a RAID array just to make sure that your drives suddenly just don't buy the farm. And you can't protect against everything anyways, no matter how hard you try, as uh, my week has proven so far at my day job, that you can't protect against everything. Having Amazon suddenly forget what DNS is is not a good time for anybody. So. Transactions should be dur durable. However, there's all kinds of failures. A system crash. Something other than the database server causes a kernel panic and the server shits the bed. Great. Uh, there's a power failure. So your server's there happily running on a UPS. The power's been out for 24 hours. Your UPS is about to die. And you have if you make it 24 hours on a UPS, you've got a really good UPS. Like mine at home for my PC gives me maybe an hour if I'm lucky. 
and it's a 750 watt hour battery. So, you know, um, they're, they're okay. Disc crashes. Uh, that was a more common one that we used to see years ago with the platters when a hard drive would suddenly just stop. Um, often you'd actually, you could, you know, you'd be, if you're working in a server room and I probably, I don't know if anybody here has ever stood in a server room on how loud they are, but you're sitting there working on one machine, suddenly hears right over the hum, you just hear the snap sound. And then at that point you start sweating, even though the room's air conditioned and you keep working, hoping that you just imagined that sound. Then you hear another snap. Then here, tick, 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 the tick of death. That means a drive just died. Usually that means that the disk stopped spinning. The old spin drives used to stop, just stop spinning. They just die. The bearings would seize, especially in high availability environments where they're running, you know, we got like 20 disks in a RAID array and they're constantly being rid and written. The disks never stop spinning. They just wear out. Uh, SSDs have got a similar issue because the memory modules just start dying, like pieces of the memory module just burn out. So, and, yeah, they overheat, they shrink, and suddenly it, because all, like what most, most people don't realize, you know your one terabyte drive you've got in your laptop, assuming you got a terabyte drive or a 500 gig drive, your 500 gig drive is actually 550 gigs. They reserve, they actually have 10% more memory than the advertised size. So as memory pieces start to die, it will start reallocating that extra little space. And when that last 50, that like last 10% is gone, it starts eating into the actual disk space. At work, we had a drive, we went from 500 gigs, and then one day a guy rebooted, he goes, something's kind of weird, Windows is telling me my drive size changed. Really, let's take a look at that, 480 gig drive. Well, that's kind of cool, I wonder what's up with that. Knowing full well, I knew what was happening. Next day he reboots, he's suddenly now at 475 gigs. His dread disk was shrinking about five gigs a day. Um, you know, so disk crashes are a common way for things to go south. User mistakes. Um, yeah. The biggest weakness in any computer system is the squishy factor. Or, you know, somebody just hits the wrong button. It happens. Sabotage. Uh, yeah, that happens. Natural disasters. That happens a lot too, depending where you are in the world. Apparently we have good windstorms around here nowadays. So, you know, there's all kinds of things that can happen. So the transaction log is the records of the details of all the transactions as they happen. Any changes that are happening to the database, how to undo these changes, and when the transactions are completed and how and what state they were in when they finished. It's not readable by a human. It's literally a blob of binary information. The log is stored on disk. It's never in memory. The log is always small because once a transaction is completed and it's committed and the server knows for a fact that data is safe, it will take that out of the log. So the log is never more than a few megabytes big. Um, the reason why it's stored on disk and not in memory is if the server crashes, you're not going to lose your log. Um, so the right head log rule is that it writes it to the log first, then it tries to commit it. If it succeeds, it will take it out of the log. So database servers will do checkpoints and older computers way back in the day had a much more challenging time with this than modern computers. So every second or two, database servers, or if suddenly there's a drop in activity, so it could be, you know, a high activity server, suddenly there's a slight drop, like a 10% drop, 20% drop, it will do a checkpoint. The checkpoint will go, anything that's been committed gets written to the physical disk. And it will also mark what transactions are currently running. And a soft system failure means that anything that is currently running is affected, whether it's a crash or a power failure. Uh, as long as the physical media is not damaged, you're probably pretty okay. That having been said, if you're running a server with a RAID array, 
And it's the rate array that fails. You have to put in the exact same rate array. Otherwise, your disks are might as well be garbage. Um, I don't know if anybody here has ever tried to run software RAID on a computer at home um, for performance reasons. You know, you put in two disks, you do a RAID zero, and it reads and writes from both disks at the same time. It treats it as one giant partition. If your motherboard dies, you lose all your data. <laughs> because you get into another motherboard, unless it's identical and you plug the wires exactly the same way, you're going to lose them. So that's, you know, system failure. So here's a few different kinds of transactions, and we're actually going to go through them one at a time. But we got basically transactions one to five. Uh, we got a checkpoint. The checkpoint is when the stuff gets written to the disk. And then the last line, the last vertical lines are system failure. In other words, somebody went and pulled the plug out of the server. Let's go with that. Okay. So any transactions that was running at the time of failure needs to be undone and restarted. Transactions that are committed since the last checkpoint need to be redone. So in other words, if a transaction is completed, but that it happens after the checkpoint finishes, it needs to be replayed up because it never got written to the disk. It's just in memory. So when we look at our graph, type one, nothing needs to be done with it. It started and finished before the checkpoint. The checkpoint fired off. It means it's written to the disk. It's durable. Type three or five need to be undone and restarted. So when we look at it, you'll see that three started here. It kept running until it hit the system failure. That means that it never got written out by the checkpoint because it wasn't finished. So it's still happening in memory. Five started after the checkpoint, and it also was happening when the system failure. Therefore, those need to be undone and then rerun. Transaction two started before the checkpoint and reached and completed after the checkpoint, but it would complete it before the system failure. That means that it's in the log saying that it completed successfully so that when the server reboots, it'll read the log, say this one was able to finish successfully, so we're just gonna redo it again, just to make sure everything's good. Transaction four, same deal. Even though it started after the checkpoint, it's in the log that it finished before the crash, so it'll get recovered. Okay, so transaction have two states, undo and redo. So undo all transactions running at the last checkpoint. Redo means it's empty. So to begin, each entry in the log starts at the last checkpoint. So if a begin transaction entry is found, it adds T to undo. If a commit is found, it moves from undo to redo. So basically, put you got a transaction going from there's nothing. It's been put in undo. It managed to commit, so then it turns into redo. So if it didn't finish, it needs to be undone because, you know, it needs to be undone. If it did finish successfully before it crashed, then it just needs to be redone. All right. So on here, we've got our five transactions that we had earlier as an example. So we got transaction one, you'll notice is not showing up anywhere down here. Why? Because it started and finished before the checkpoint. That means it completed the checkpoint, wrote it to the disk, life is good. Currently, transaction two and three are in undo state because the checkpoint was written here, four and five have not started yet. So this green line here is gonna be slowly moving this way as we go through the example. So right now, these two are in memory, but they're not committed. So they're in the undo pile. So if the server, let's say the server blew up right here. One would be safe, two and three would be discarded. Four and five haven't happened yet. Now we're moving the line forwards a little bit. So now four is started. So that means now four joins two and three in the undo pile. Five does not exist yet. Now, five has started. So now we got two, three, four, and five sitting in the undo pile because nothing has been completed, nothing has been committed. So everything must be undone. If the server were to crash right now, it's as if none of those ever happened. Now we hit the end of T2. T2 completed and committed. So T2 committed, 
So T2 is being moved from undo to redo. If somebody were to pull the plug right now, when you turn the server back on, it'll read the log and say, okay, we know there was a checkpoint at this point in time. Transaction two completed successfully, but it was not written to disk. So we're just going to replay it. Now we reach the end of T4. T4 completed. It gets written to the log, but it's not committed yet because we never hit the checkpoint. And, well, then we hit the last line, which I'm pretty sure I have another slide for that, but I don't know where it is right now. You hit the last line. That's when somebody pulled the plug. You know, somebody was, you know, putting a new rack, a new server in the rack mount and tripped over the wire and pulled the plug. You know, a toilet upstairs leaked into the server rack. Um, something went off. Um, and I, when I say that one about the toilet upstairs leaking to the server rack, it's because it almost happened at my day job. Uh, we had a server, we had our server room. Little did we know that right above our server room was the upstairs tenant's bathroom. We needed to run some new wires into the server room. So we took the panels out of the ceiling and right above the rack is the P-trap from the upstairs toilet. And I'm like, uh, let's go get about five, six really strong guys and we're going to move this rack over three feet. So, you know, that was a very exciting day because we could actually see moisture on the P-trap. So the, one of the seals was like, had this super slow leak. So the water would start dripping down the pipe and just dry out before it reached the bottom. We're like, let's move that over. And then we got them to go hire a plumber to go fix that. But it was very exciting. So that line is failure. So at this current state, t transaction two and four will be redone. Three and five are going to get discarded. And they're marked as undo. <laughs> Got a really dry mouth. All right. Forwards recovery. Forwards recovery are for the redo. Um, so what happens is it works its way through the log from the oldest to the newest, redoing anything that is marked as a redo. It'll bring the database up to date to the consistency it should have been just when it shit the bed. <laughs> Backwards recovery is we need to undo. So it'll work its way through the log from the, the end back. So that the, basically what's happening is they're doing this. And once they reach equilibrium, that means that they're no longer, this one's done, this one's done. And that will return things to a consistent state. In other words, anything like when I was talking here where it blew up and there's half done, it undoes that so that the database is consistent. So media failures are a significantly more serious issue. Um, <clears throat> the data disk, the data stored to the disk is damaged. Hope you have a backup. The transaction log itself may be damaged. That's not good either, uh, because if you lose the transaction log, you'll lose what's happening in that moment of time. Um, system failures are not necessarily too severe. It's only the, last, the information says the last checkpoint is affected. Uh, that can be covered through the transaction log unless you lost your transaction log. So as a rule of thumb, if you have a really good piece of database software, we're not going to talk about MySQL, you will normally store your data on a different set of disks than your transaction log. And usually the the Wherever your transaction log is stored, you'll probably want it in at least in a RAID 0, a mirrored RAID, so that there's two disks that are always in sync. That way, if you lose one disk, you can always recover from the other disk. Um, yeah. But the good news is, if you lose the transaction log, at most, you're going to lose a second or two of data. So... In a very, very large environment like Amazon, that's a lot of data. In an environment where, like where I work, we might lose five minutes and not lose any data, depending on what just what time of day it is. So we want to have backups frequently. We're back to that backup discussion from two weeks ago. Um, so you want to at least have daily backups. Uh, you want to back up to something, not the machine. Uh, 
So backups are needed to recover from media failure because at least if you can recover the backup log and the database, and you have that as you can restore those and you'll have a good time. It can be time consuming, causes a lot of downtime. And recover from media failure. Normally you'll restore the database to the last known backup, then use the transaction log to redo any changes since the last backup. Now, different database servers will do the transaction log differently. It'll actually do a bunch of different transaction logs, small ones, so that you can go from, you know, whatever, midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., so you can replay it to get up to the point of crash. Um, if the transaction log is damaged, you can't do step two. So, as I said, you probably want to store the log on a separate uh, physical device than the database. The cool thing on Linux, which you guys have learned a little bit thanks to your Raspberry Pis, although your Raspberry Pis only have one drive for your memory card, right? Is when you mount devices on Linux, it's a directory. Right? There's no drive letters on Unix, Linux, and Macs. So what you end up doing is, um, I know MySQL and Postgres store their data under var lib. So there's like var slash lib slash MySQL, var lib slash var slash lib slash Postgres. And what you do is you put those directories on different disk. Even though it's part of the same directory structure, they're on a separate disk. So if the main OS dies, you don't lose your database. And then you can also store your binary log if you choose on a different partition again. Um, so the more it's spread out, the safer it's going to be. All right, concurrency. Now we're actually, I think this is the last, one of the last slides, and then I'll do a quick demo. So concurrency, large databases are used by many people. For example, banks, Amazon, uh, the CRA you know, tax people, even not necessarily huge companies will still have very busy databases. So what happens is many transactions are run at the same time. So the transactions will run concurrently. However, it needs to be still isolated from each other. So if we don't allow for concurrency, transactions are run sequentially. That means you got a queue of transactions. And you, if you have really long transactions like a backup, it'll make everybody else wait. So a good example of that is this room. This room is perfect as it is an example. It has four doors. If we need to evacuate this room, we can actually get everybody out of here fairly quickly because we've got four doors. If you only have one door, it's going to take longer because everybody's got to file out the door at a specific space, right? And so what happens is the concurrency manager in the database server um, will identifies what pieces of data are being touched and it just isolates those pieces. So if I'm updating my account, it's not going to lock the whole table for everybody else. It's just going to lock my row. So the concurrency handles that so that you can have you can have it writing to five different accounts at the same time. It won't care unless the accounts all relate to each other. Um so to run transactions in uh, concurrently, we interleave their operations. Each transaction gets a share of the computing time. It's also known as preemptive multitasking. In other words, transaction one does step one, transaction two does its step one, transaction one does its step two, transaction two does its step two. And they take turns. And then, you know, at the same time, the database server is also reading and writing stuff off the disk. Um, so they each get their share of the time. Um, however, that can have all kinds of problems. You can lose updates if something goes wrong. Uh, you could have uncommitted updates, uh, incorrect stats, uh, especially when the isolation is broken. Um, that's the issues with concurrency. A good database server has a really good concurrency engine, so it keeps things separate from each other. Um, if you're really curious about how that, all that works, I can probably dig out some texts for you guys that can go into it in detail. Um, I know it's a third level, it's a third year university topic. So if you're actually going through university to be a database engine specialist, they have entire courses dedicated to transactions and the math that goes with it, because there's a lot of math. Okay, right. now for the demo.
So I've got a simple table. It's called sample. And sample right now has six rows. Nice and simple. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to establish a second connection. And I literally do it by just double clicking. So lab eight, that's like one of the first steps is what I just did. You just open up a second connection. So when you read the lab and it says, hey, I want you to open up a second connection, don't overthink it. It's literally telling you to launch a second tab. Okay. Now, So here we got six, and here we've got six. We've got the exact same amount of stuff. Now, if I were to go insert into sample name, all right, so I'm not running a transaction right now. I'm just gonna run this. This is called an implicit transaction. In other words, it's going to run the commands, and at the end, every semicolon, it will commit it. So if I go to my second tab, you will see that Jenny's there. I just added her in. Cool. Now, what I'm about to do, though, is I'm going to slap in a keyword called begin. Begin tells a database server, Start a transaction now. So I am going to insert um, Frank. And I'm going to hit run. And if we look at um, here's Frank, right? Because notice I'm still operating in my single tab. If I go to my other tab and I go run, Frank is not there. Because currently the transaction has begun. It's now ephemeral. It's happening. It's in memory. It hasn't been committed or rolled back. So this transaction, as long as I'm sitting here talking, this the database server is saying, dude started working, he's not finished it yet. So we're just going to hold on to these changes. It's all good. So now if I come here and I go, um, if I add in commit and I'll run the commit command, just the commit command, and I go back to my second tab, here's Frank. Now I just demonstrated the consistency because now it's been written, it's available to everybody else. I'm going to start this again, and I'm going to add a new person. I'm running out of names. Like that. I'm also going to go uh, delete from uh, sample where ID is equal to three. I'm going to take the commit off because I don't want to accidentally run the commit. And I'm also going to do an update. Update sample set name equal to geez. I tell my brain's tired I can't even type a single SQL statement properly where ID is equal to two okay so I'm going to run this this is going to be considered a single unit of work so I'm going to run it I'm going to hit go it says down here, one matched, one changed, no warnings. If I come over here and I hit run, everything is still there because the other one has happened. If I come back to my first one and I go back to my first query just to show you that, yes, my change is there, right? So uh, I deleted three, I renamed two, and I added Anya. If I come back to this tab here and I type in rollback instead, and I run this. Nothing is published here. Everything's back the way it was here. 
this is the power of a transaction. Did you have a question? I saw the hand twitch really quick and I'm going, he's trying to make his mind. Okay, so literally that's literally all there is transactions, what I just did. As far as a programmer is concerned, there are other things in a transaction that you can do. There's things called um, um, checkpoints where you can actually mark a transaction that's partly completed and you can roll back to checkpoint one or checkpoint two and retry those steps. There's all kinds of things you can do with a transaction if you have really complex code. Let's say, you know, you did an insert for ABC and then suddenly step D didn't work. You can roll back after ABC finished and try D again. There's things you can do. However, when you use checkpoints and you trigger off the checkpoint, the rollback will only ever go back to the last checkpoint. You'd have to issue a special rollback command to roll back the entire thing. Uh, MySQL, so every database server supports transactions nowadays. MySQL being MySQL is special. If you are using a different table type, um, remember at the start of the term when I had you guys um, make sure that your engine was set to NODB? This was for in preparation for this lab. If you use any other engine in MySQL other than NODB, which stands for Innovative Database, in other words, they were bringing features that everybody else has had for 15 years, so it was innovative. They were pulling an apple. If you pick my isom, it will begin the transaction. It'll do every command like it, the transaction is happening, except it ignores the begin command. It just tells you it ran. It will actually do them all live. Um, the other thing about MySQL that's a little weird is if you have an error in your code, it only, it stops at that point. It doesn't roll back. So if you issue a commit, let's just say these two worked, but this one did not. And I do a commit, it'll still commit those two lines. You have to be careful. So if you're writing code that uses a transaction like a bank, what they do is after they issue every command, they'll check the result code and then decide if they're going to issue a rollback based on the results. So if you get an error back from the query, then it'll, they'll issue the rollback. You can't trust MySQL's automatic rollback. Um, different database servers have settings. For example, in Postgres, I can set the transaction to go rollback on error. And it doesn't roll back just the one statement, it rolls back the entire transaction on error. Another thing that causes an implicit commit is in the middle of that, if I were to alter that sample table, it would commit the changes to that point. And it though that 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 those structure changes are immediate. So you know transactions are not there to help you with your DDL changes. Okay, so although it's not the data you're using for the lab, I literally showed you the entire lab. Like that's pretty much every step for this lab. So when you go to do lab eight, just pay attention to what the instructions tell you to do. When it'll tell you, open up another tab, run this in tab one, run this in tab two. What is your row count? What I'm watching, some of you will make mistakes because there's a spot where it says, okay, it's going to insert, insert these five rows or these 10 rows or these 200 rows or whatever. And they'll hit run two or three times. So instead of having like 200 rows, they'll have like 600 rows or whatever. What I'm worried about is at the end of spots where I'll say, okay, what's the count in tab one? What's the row count in tab two? Row count in tab one, row count in tab two. As long as I see the numbers are different from each tab, I'm happy. So don't panic if your numbers aren't exactly the same as somebody else's. As long as your numbers are going up and down the same way as somebody else's, you're fine. And yeah, that's uh, transactions. Yay. That's the end of today. Um, so again, lab eight is there for your enjoyment. Uh, next week, I'm actually going to do la uh, lectures for week 12 and 13, probably on the same day. So next week will be a slightly longer lecture, like than compared to the, like the last three, um, specifically because the topics go hand in hand and it doesn't make sense to really split it up over two lectures. Of course, if it runs long, I'll stop and just pick up the next week. 
Uh, but essentially, next week's lecture will cover everything you need for the last two labs. Okay. And that is that. And